I'm E.G. Marshall. In the year 1692, an American town went mad. Or at least that part of it known as Salem Village. Beginning with accusations of ten young girls that a West Indian slave had bewitched them, hysteria ran like a rabid dog through the village. Within four months, hundreds were arrested and tried, 31 of whom were hanged or burned, and one pressed to death with stones. And the man generally blamed for the hideously bigoted persecution of the innocent and the helpless was a name reviled in our history, Cotton Mather. Hear me, witch maid. If you do not confess your unholy wickedness, you shall not even be accorded the mercy of being hanged. Instead, we will burn you alive. Or perhaps, hands and feet tied together, we shall lay you on the ground, while the villagers shall come and heap stone upon stone on you, until the life is driven from your body as you are pressed to death. No, no! Merciful God, please! No! mystery drama, Burn, Witch, Burn, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. At the time of the witch hunt, no man in our country was more feared than Cotton Mather. The picture of this dark, imperious, infamous man who led the persecution, who in his perverted zeal and fanatic puritanism saw men, women, and even children condemned on the flimsiest of evidence, who swept down from his Boston pulpit like a scourge, and whose blind conviction in his righteousness in the name of the Lord spread terror like a plague is strangely... Oh, but then I should say no more. For what I was about to say is a large part of this story. Burn, witch! Burn! You should welcome the fires of hell, since he would not repent. The abomination of the body you defiled remains to be purified, while the flesh is consumed and returned to the earth and ashes, while the bones melt and run into the fire. Sisters, brothers... Let us lift up our voices in prayer. Let the mischief of their own deeds fall on their own heads. Let hot burning coals fall on them. Let them be cast into the fire that they never rise again. The righteous also shall give thanks unto thy name, and the just continue in thy sight. Amen. 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 Now let ye all return to your homes and meditate upon the grace of our Heavenly Father and return tomorrow so that ye may see the other witch perish as she deserves. The fire has almost burned itself out. Yes, Judge Sewell. And the evil it rings. Would it not have been more humane to hang her? Humane? Speak you about a witch? This is a pestilence whose deadly poison spreads as relentlessly as the pox itself. (sighs) This witchery business weighs heavy on my soul. Why? The women were both guilty in your mind, were they not? They were so found by a jury. Well, then, what choice had you? I don't know. The times are running at such fever. I cannot breast the tide even if I wanted to. What worries me most is that I cannot see an end to it. Or who will be next cried out against? The truth will ever out. Where the evil lies, the finger will point, and justice shall meet out the rest. Come, come, I I must get to the tavern for a flagon of wine to cleanse the taste in my mouth. Who will you join me? Shortly, good judge. For the moment, I think my good offices may be needed by a young member of the cloth who appears to be ill. Know you him? The great hulking fellow in the long coat with a thick cape and the wide-brimmed hat? 
He's a papist, thank you. Nay, nay, but near as bad. An Episcopalian, quite recently here from England. Were it not for his formidable strength and his skill as a blacksmith, he might have fared badly here in Salem Village. Go to the tavern. I shall join you shortly. I would speak with this young man. Do not anger him. He has superhuman strength. I am clothed in a Lord's armor. I have no fear. And I have no intention of angering him. I only want to help him. Have it your way. I shall meet you at the tavern. Shortly. I shall not be long. You appear in trouble, good sir. May I be of help? I can find no help, kind sir, except within myself. And from my God, I pray. The second with the strongest staff to lift you up. I speak as a man of God. As you are, I understand. I pray I still am, or can be, after what I have witnessed today. Have a care what you say. It has the reek of blasphemy. There is another kind of blasphemy in theology, sir. The crime of assuming to oneself the rights of God, as the people of this town have done. By trying a witch and burning her? Do you not believe, when the devil has taken possession, that the evil must be purified by fire or destruction of the diseased body and soul? I think there are other ways of casting out the devil. You were at the trial? All through the long horror of it. And you did not find these witches guilty? I found the evidence circumstantial and more than easy to comprehend two ways. I looked upon the face of that sweet young woman and upon the dignity and breathing of the older one, her grandmother, and I could see their innocence. What? Will you claim us wrong in our trial and judgment? Is it because you are not either a true colonist or of the true faith? As to being a colonist, this is my chosen country. I have left England behind me. As to the true faith, my religion is a matter I prefer not to argue. There are many faiths, but most of them lead to God. You are a strange young man. What is your name? Gilbert Caton. And may I ask yours? The Reverend Cotton Mather of Boston. You? If I'd been in my right senses, I would scarcely have passed the time of day with you. What does that mean? Turn around, sir, and look at your handiwork. A few smoldering ashes containing what, what once was the body of another human being. Are you proud of your work? I did not find this woman guilty. That was for the court to decide. I believe in justice as firmly as I do in the threat of Satan. But where the fiend is proven to flourish, he must be stamped out. But where was this fiend and these women? What were they guilty of? I am but recently here from Boston. I am not familiar with all the transcripts. But would you question the word of a man such as Sir John Jameson? Does his title give him immunity? The facts do that, Mr. Caton. That these women drew his body from his bed in the night, brought him by occult means to their cottage in the forest, to try to lure him into lechery... An original sin with the younger of the two witches? Is Sir John so good a man? Has he led so good a life? Is it not possible? Quiet, sir! You do yourself no service by even thinking such a thought. Have a care with your words. Or fingers may go pointing your way. Oh, God. I'd near given you up, Reverend Cotton. I believe you have the acquaintance of Sir John Jameson. Your servant, sir. The Reverend Cotton Mather. He needs no introduction to me or any man of goodwill. It was an honor to have you with us for the witch burning. Uh, you were not here for all the trial, I believe. No, just for the last day. Uh, it was with a heavy heart that I had to bring the charges. But the evidence was monumental. Is it not so, Judge? Mm, there was enough of it brought. But I cannot banish the woman's cries from my ears. As the fire reached her, ah. and the face of the young girl we condemn to die tomorrow has troubled me for nights. Must we then, because of a round cheek and melting eyes, shrink from doing the Lord's bidding? Evil is the way of such a maid, and more to be dreaded than all the hags in Christendom. Strange rumors are afloat regarding her. This woman she called Granny, who was burned this morning, did pray not for her own life, but that the witch may be saved. An uncanny thing that one witch should desire good to another witch. But if they were kin... Fool! Can you not perceive the work of the devil in this? 
the witch who died at the stake would have the other saved so that her own black spirit could pass into the fair young woman's form. And thus, with double force, the two could continue to wreak havoc on the world. For the sake and peace of the community, she cannot be destroyed too soon. I must go visit the prison. I wish to question her more closely. Question her? About what? The evidence has all been established? The factual evidence I care little for. That is and was the court's business. I wish to find out if she will recant so that perhaps her soul might be saved. That would be a triumph supreme for me to accomplish in the name of the Lord. Are you not somewhat aged for such a job, my friend Turnkey? <laughs> 81. <laughs> Going on 82. Just the man for the job. She don't get around me with any of her witches' brandishments. Are we near the cell? Almost there, your reverend lordship. Why? Let us all move as silently as possible. Is there a view hole in the door? Aye, there is. Good. Then I can look in on her and perhaps surprise her in some evil doing. Uh, here it is. I'll open it soft. Can you see the harpy? Yes. Is she weaving some spell? No. She sits on the pallet knitting. Why? She's a frail little thing. Not much more than a child. All part of the enchantery. I was taken in myself. But she is tricks, all tricks, as I learned when she tempted me to ruin. Oh, very well. Jailer, let us go in. And your little chip desires. Hey, my little she devil. Here's two gentlemen of quality to see you. One is of no quality. I know him only too well. The other, I believe I recognize as the Reverend Cotton Mather. You may leave us, Jailer, but wait outside. Yes, sir. It is true. I am who you say. And what would you have with me, sir? I have come to pray with you, Luna Clare, and to exhort you to confession. There is no confession. I am no witch. Will you kneel with me in prayer at least, daughter? I cannot, sir. Why not? I am not of your persuasion. Do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Then we have that in common and can try to pray and wrestle the demon from your bosom. No. You do not wish to be delivered? Obstinate of heart I may be, but Sir John holds me from prayer. I cannot kneel in company with him. I pray thee, Sir John. Go outside and stand in the corridor. We shall see if the witch maid, relieved of your presence, will pray. I had hoped to listen on the chance that she should confess so that I might make some valuable notes. The Lord granted me a ready pen. I shall make my own notes if it be necessary. If you will excuse us, Sir John. You have only to command, Tasta, and I to obey. If you should need help of any kind, I shall be just beyond the door. Let us kneel together, my daughter, and pray to God. Minister? Yes? What shall I pray for? My life? That I may be delivered from the burning and death? Your death is already ordained by the court. We pray for you to recant. Your body cannot be saved. The only hope is to find God's mercy... On your immortal soul. On the stone cold floor, the slight figure of the maiden, a girl not yet in her twenties, sways and sags at the harsh dictum of the man beside her. He, Cotton Mather, kneels ramrod straight. His voice rasps as he speaks aloud unending platitudes devoid of hope. Beside him, the maid prays to herself, the tears running down her pale cheeks. There is talk of God and the right and goodness and light, but not one trace of pity here. I shall return shortly with Act Two.
Sir John's attitude outside the jail cell is less unconcerned than it seems. He paces only a short stretch of the passageway, always within earshot of the endless prayer from the cell. The full-voiced exhortations of the minister he pays little heed to, but he stretches his ear to the fullest for any whisper from the maid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. You do not even say amen. I beg your worship's pardon, but I am not familiar with your prayers, and I do not understand the God you pray to. You refuse to recant? How can I recant? I'm innocent. I beg of you, sir, to listen to what I was not allowed to say in court, and you will understand that neither Granny nor I had it. Sir John? I have another. You may return. I uh, request your favor, sir, but I believe I heard that your prayers had ended. Mine, sir. The witch maid was not moved to pray. I suspected as much. Tell me, daughter, what you were about to reveal as Sir John came in. Oh, I... We came here. It's difficult, Minister. And tell her, Miss Anna Witch. <laughs> tell him about Giles Corey, the old yeoman who saw you conversing with Satan in the forest near your house. He said it was Satan that I was in Congress with that night. <laughs> then he was in your shape. And well, your lordship knows, the old man was frightened by your threats into lying and saying it was a black fiend, which you might as well be, seeing your purpose there. Silence, <laughs> woman. I was not there, could not have been, since all my household has testified that I was safe at home in bed and asleep. There's one lie, they all lie to save their skin. For surely they are more afraid of your power than the devil. May you go too far. Have a care with your tongue. Hear me, mistress, I threaten you this. If you do not confess your unholy wickedness, you shall not be even accorded the mercy of being hanged. Instead, you will be burned alive. <laughs> or perhaps, or perhaps, hand and feet tied together, we shall lay you on the ground, while the villagers shall come and heap stones upon stones until the life is driven out of your body and you are pressed to death. <laughs> oh, no, merciful God, please. And I, I, whom you have afflicted, shall count each one as it falls. I shall myself drop the first stone. And I... When the first stone strikes me, God, in his mercy, will take me to himself. You can count the stones the others throw. But I shall never know how fast they fall. Now let us use all zeal to our ends, but let us deal in compassion as far as it is compatible with justice. To do any living thing unwarranted torture is a reflection on our manhood. One last word. Will you confess at last that you are a witch? I cannot confess what is not true. Come then, Sir John. Let us leave her to ready herself for death. This November wind whistles through the bones. It will snow soon. I welcome the walk and the wind to blow some cobwebs from my mind. You are troubled by something? This affair savors ill. Her last cry awoke strange feelings and my heart turned within me. You are a man of God and compassion, but have a care. Her powers of enchantment are strong and wicked. If only I could have reached her. No one can do that. Perhaps. Perhaps not. You intend to return to question the girl again? No, let her rest in what peace she can find in the little life left to her to lead. Ah. Are you then for your room as soon as we reach the inn? No. I have an errand I must pursue. I have my coach at the inn yard. I should be honored to take you anywhere you desire. Thank you but I prefer to travel on this one by myself. Master Mather, what brings you here? I wish to ask you a question, Master Caton. Will you enter? No, thank you. I have not even hitched my horse. I have other riding to do. Then ask your question. Were you aware that the witch maid who is to die is an Episcopalian? Yes, I was aware. 
then that prompts others. Why did you not go to her to bring her comfort or to help her cleanse her soul? I would have gone to bring her comfort, but they barred me from entering the prison. If I arrange it so you can enter, would you go to her? With all my heart. Why do you extend her this comfort, convinced as you are that she is a witch? I have failed to bring her comfort myself or release from bondage. Perhaps because we are of different denominations, that is of no matter. I shall ride now to the prison and have all preparations made that you may visit her this evening. It wants but an hour until dark. Wait one hour beyond that to make sure you will be passed in. May God go with you. All these comings and goings over a little snip of a girl whose heels might as well be dancing in the wind and snow already. It sounds as though you were already celebrating the spectacle. Well... A man has little enough to amuse him with winter upon us. Here. When you come out, do you lock up tight behind you? Bring me the key in the common room. It's too cold to wait upon you priests in your eternal preaching in these freezing hours. Here you go. You, a witch, visitor to see you. Who? Who is it? Give me the torch, turnkey. Well, how, how am I to find my way back to the common room? Tis known ground for you. Feel your way, if not else. Uh, how could I, a stranger, find my way without one? Oh, no, no, Lord of mercy. Well, let me hold it then a moment till I find my way to the stairs. Go then, and hurry. Have no fear. The cold will move even my old bones like the young. And so. I... Are you come to torture me? Hi. Look at me in the torchlight. Can you not recognize I am of the clergy? God be with you. I am of your persuasion. Oh, at least God has answered one of my prayers. Oh, my daughter, do not crouch on the floor. Come to me so that I may comfort you. I, I want to, Father, but this chain about my leg. <gasps> my poor feathered bird. Rest where you are as I come to you. Oh, my dear Lord. Lord. You are frozen with cold. And you are warm. A moment. Let me let me brace the torch here in the sconce. Now, my heavy cape off and let me wind it about you. Oh, let me touch your hand. Let me feel once again some human warmth. Let us sit on the pallet and I will hold you in my arms with a cloak about it. Oh, you're warm. And you've brought light and companionship. How can they call so sweet a creature of God a witch? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm only a maid. I'm so scared. Well, are you really an Episcopalian priest? Ordained in England at Ely. I come here for new worlds to conquer and to help tame a savage land. To make my life my home my family someday. Mm -hmm. Cold welcome you get from the Puritans. <laughs> They're not all so bad as they are sometimes painted. And I am young enough to wait out their welcome. How could... How could they have condemned you as a witch? I don't know. First they said Granny was a witch. And I lived with her. Did your grandmother practice magic art? Oh, well, she knew about herbs that helped to heal. And she could make poultices that drew out pain. And sobs that she rubbed in with her hands that brought relief to others. Is that wicked? I cannot see why. Who taught her these things? She learned them long ago from a nurse she had, who learned them from a gypsy. My grandparents were very rich, with a large estate. But the Indians attacked them. and killed my mother and father and, and everyone. And only Granny and I were left. And she was always a little queer after that. I mean, she wouldn't live in a town, only in the country. She was very good to me, and, and we were happy enough until Joseph, the, the one servant that we had left, died. How long ago was that? Um, a few years. I, I, I don't remember exactly now. We buried Joseph, and then Granny said we must leave the house and start walking to the coast. Why to the coast? To take a boat for England. 
to my uncle. And we never did reach the boat. We stopped in a little house in the woods near here, and Granny was ill for a long time, and the rent was not cheap. At last, the money was gone. And then, Granny made some money with her healing. And she was also a, a midwife until... The... I, I was at the trial. I know that testimony. Someone had a child born that was not not quite right. Yes, Sir John Jameson's daughter. That's what started it all. Oh, God. Oh, me. Oh, burn me. <laughs> Are you kind? Are you human? <laughs> Cannot you save me from them? No, first, first tell me one more thing. You mean from Sir John? Yes. He is the devil himself. You paid him rent all these years that you grew into a beautiful woman? Yes. And, and then you had no money? He, he threatened to throw you out unless... He, he talked of being possessed by the devil. He, he was the one who wanted to, to possess me. He was the devil. And you were willing to be possessed? And, and, and when the child, when that awful thing happened, he said that he would point to Granny as a... And me, too. He came to the house that awful night. I told him I'd kill him and then myself if he tried to touch me. Oh, my poor child. Oh, please, please. I don't want to be burned. Can't you save me somehow? Save me your, somehow. Your soul? I, I do not believe that means save No, no, me. My body. Or if you can't, kill me here with your own hands. I do not fear death. I have nothing to live for. I feel only torture. Save you. No. Save you if it were possible, but... For what? Afterwards, to, to be hunted, pursued, retaken? Then kill me. No, no, never. Now, now that I have, I have found you. Father, please. Now, hush. Hush, little one. Not father. Not to you. Gil. Gil. And I am Luna. <laughs> Luna. Now... And you will swear to do everything I tell you. You think there is a way? There is hope. There is always hope. And I think, I think there is a way. Yes, I think there is a way if only God will smile on us. A man and a maid. And under the most harrowing and desperate of conditions, from the blackness of adversity, nurtured by the strength of their faith, the first seeds of love are planted in both hearts. But can this compassionate and tortured young man free this ill-starred maid? And even having done so, where can they find safety or sanctuary? I'll return shortly with Act Three. <laughs> In the dim, dank, freezing cell, Gil Caton stands with the torch held on high, his eyes searching, his mind racing, a wild plan formulating in his mind, frustrated at the very outset by the leg iron which binds Luna to the wall. She sits huddled in the blessed warmth of the heavy cloak, watching this man who has become the center of her universe, secure in her heart, that he will find a way to save her. The first problem is the leg iron. Once, once I get you to my house, I, I have forge and anvil and, and tools to cut it away. The wall. The wall is the only hope. But the ring is buried in the masonry. Oh, not quite. In the mortar. Now, between the stones. Now, here, hold the torch. I can, I, I can brace my feet against the wall. And pull it out. The Lord must have had some reason... To bless me with this extra ring. That is starting from your brow. Yeah, no matter. If this ring starts from the wall one more. Oh. Oh. Pull it out. You pulled it out. That's more than human strength could do. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Now, 
Now, listen to me, Luna. Yes. You must trust me to the uttermost. Now, let me lift you and see how heavy you are. Oh, oh Heather. <laughs> it can be done. What can be done? Now, I'm going to put you on my back and carry you out of the prison beneath my cassock. Oh, I see. And, I, and I'll be very still. Oh. Forgive me now, but you must take off your frock. My frock? Uh, well, you must arrange it in the corner with a, a stuffing of straw to look like you. Oh, of course. I'll do that. Uh, when I take off my sash, I'm Catholic. Oh, if I can just arrange it so to believe it to be me, it might give us more time. Oh, what is it? What have you done? Oh, I just slipped my cassock all the way from below the waist to the neck bend to, to make room for you. How clever you are. <laughs> Adversity sharpens the brain. Now, now, quick. Now, climb on the stool. So, now, arms around my neck. Yes. First, now, a cassock. Help me slip it over our heads. Oh, that's fine. Fine. Room for us both. Now, to help support you, I, I bind my sash tight around us both. Oh, too tight? Can you breathe? Mm-hmm. Right. Now, I must block the cell door. There. I must douse the torch. The more we are in darkness, the safer we are. I trust in you. And your strength. And your belief. And in the Almighty. A jailer? Jailer? Oh! God? Sanji? What you do? Is it the pesta? Where's your light? The witch has blown it out and left me in the darkness. I had to lock her back in the cell against the danger to us all. Tell me if I'll come down again in this blackness. You say you locked the cell? Is she secure? As secure as she can be. Well, then, find your own way up in the shadows to the prison door. The light there is poor. It's just what I wanted. Now, if you ever prayed, my little one, pray now. Freedom is just a few short steps away. Ah, whither away so late in the evening, Master Matter? You still at the inn, Sir John? I should have thought you were ridden home by now. I, uh, I had some business on my mind. I should have thought you might be abed. I've been in my chambers reading the transcript of the trial which my friend Judge Sewell was kind enough to make available to me. Why would you wish to read all that? The thing is set complete. There are some questions I would ask the maid, and I I feel in duty bound to make some last attempt to see if she has repented. Then you go to the prison? This moment. I shall be glad to drive you there. No. No, I ride there myself. No, do I think you should go near her again. For some reason, you inhibit her. As you said. But the visit is useless. By law, the die is cast, and she will hang or burn tomorrow. I have no power to free her body. I still may have hope to free her soul and bring her comfort. Good night, sir. Are you all right? Do you want breath? I think that that much. Of all the luck, I can just make the shadow of the tree. Your other case, is it not? Oh, why, yes. Yes, not the matter. I thought I recognized that giant bulk, even in the shadows. By Harry, you seem even larger than I remembered. Uh, just the, the bulk of my cape. Are you from the prison? Why, yes. Did you see the maid? Yes. Did she recant? No, sir. She will never recant. Because she is innocent. A matter of opinion, we shall see. You are bound for the prison. I am. I, uh, I beg you in the name of him we worship in our own ways to disturb this wretched girl no further. She is mercifully asleep now. Leave her the last few hours in peace in the name of compassion and humanity. I have certain questions for her, but if... But let God ask them when, when she is sent to face him tomorrow. Well, we shall see. If she be asleep, perhaps I will not wake her. Good night, Master Caton. Oh, what misfortune... Hold fast. We must make all haste now and hope all is not lost. Oh! Oh! Oh, oh 
forgive me. It's just that time may be so important. Oh, any hurt is worth being free. Strike away. Try the file now. And once my feathers are off, what then, Gil? Oh, I don't know. The hue and cry will be raised all over this bloody town. We've just gone mad. I have no horse to give you. I had hopes, perhaps, by boat. But I have neither money nor contact to see you safe away. It must be on foot. But be of good faith. Somehow the Lord will provide. How can I ever thank you with all that I feel in my heart? Oh, just let me see that smile break across your lovely face and it will be thanks enough. Strange way to meet the man I dreamed of. Oh, You're almost through. I cannot eat more. You must eat as much as possible. And you can carry a little with you. We must find you some clothes to wear. What? Good Lord, not so soon. Don't let them take me. Don't... Into the bedroom, quick. Now, if I cannot turn them back, I can hold them back. Now, take my cape. It has what money I have in the pockets. Now, go by the window and, and try to make for Providence. There's an Episcopalian church there where you will be safe. I must go without you. You must. You must save yourself. My place is too hard. I'll never love any other man but you. Nora, I hope. Now, go to quickly to the bedroom. Perhaps, perhaps God is with us yet. I'll be listening and praying. Oh, forgive my tardiness, but... I was at my devotion, sir. You will pardon my intrusion, I hope. Do I speak to Mr. Gilbert Caton, the parson, here? You do? Uh, dear, I beg a few minutes of your valuable time, sir. I am trying to trace my mother and my young niece. My name is Clare, Leonard Clare of Clare Hall, County Devon. My father had a large estate west of here, which was attacked by Indians. All of my family were killed, save my mother and niece who, I am told, escaped. Since I arrived but lately in this country, I have only now, with tolerable certainty, traced them to this district. Uh, the town authorities claimed no knowledge of them, but since they were of the Episcopal faith, deemed that you might know something. Come in, sir. Come out of the cold. Thank you. Thank you. You have horses? Your horses and a coach, yes. Then you must fly this minute. Huh? Uh, fly? The people of Salem burned your mother as a witch. Uh, I saw her burn. Uh, Outside there, in the market. Oh, good Lord. They have fixed the burning of your niece for tomorrow. <laughs> there is to be a holiday so the folks may revel in the sight. To burn my niece, Luna? And you have the temerity to ask Leonard Clare to fly? With her. Luna! Luna, my baby. Ah, my brother's baby. Oh. What have they done to you? Nothing yet that can't be repaired. But there is no... Oh. Not now. What's the matter? Do not be alarmed. I come here in amity, not in enmity. You? I shall explain in a moment. May I meet the gentleman before I speak? This is Luna's uncle. Leonard Clare of Clare Hall, Devon. Now of the colonies. And I promise you, a man of resources... A man well able to afford to fight the persecution of this town and its shame and all your power and evilness. I would advise you not to try, sir. No, hear me out. As to my motives, my honesty, my devotion to the God I believe in, and my determination to wipe out witchcraft, I will not bandy words. I do what I believe to be right, and let history be the judge. Your name will go down in it as a stench in the nostrils of any humane man. So be it. I follow where I am called. Tonight, profoundly troubled after rereading the transcript of this child's trial and her grandmother's, perforce I could come to only one conclusion. A tragic miscarriage of justice had already been done. Another was about to occur. I went to prison determined to free the maid myself and to offer her my protection against the wild riot which would follow on her release. That was when we met you on the road. Yes, sir. You tried to put me off. I can see why now, but God directed my footsteps there. I must tell you that her absence had been discovered before I even arrived, and that the mob is gathering all the roads out of this town will be closed to everyone. They cannot stop me. They will, unless you have safe conduct. 
I suggest you get your niece into the coach post haste and yourself draw the curtains and I'll conduct you and your men through the mob. I will not go without you. The least I owe you for saving Luna's life. You had best join them, Master Caton. When that drunken jailer wakes up to remember you saw her last, you will be torn limb from limb. It is a good bargain, a life for a life. Ah, and you, sir? I have no fear for mine, and I have much work to do. For all his title and position, Sir John Jameson must be brought to book for his crime against you and yours. I shall see that he is. And perhaps I may need one small breath of perfume to dilute that stench my name is to leave in history. While the account you have heard is a fictional one, it is a somewhat sad thing that Cotton Mather is painted as black as he is. Even in his obsession against witchcraft, he was a scrupulous defender of all he thought unjustly accused. He was a scholar, in some sense a scientist, and for all he was a fanatic, it was without thought of personal gain. He was also a family man, and perhaps would have allowed himself one frosty smile of pleasure at the outcome of this whole affair. I shall return shortly. The madness at Salem was of short duration, and the good people of that unfortunate town soon returned to their senses. Gil Caton and his wife Luna did not return, mostly because of tragic memories but also because the first of a long line of little Caton was well on its way. They were married in Rhode Island, one of the colonies most noted for its freedom of thought, and lived out a long and happy life together, nurturing their own children and that other larger group of children, the congregation of Pastor Gil Caton's church, which flourished in all good things, temporal as well as sacred. And so, amen. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Marion Seldes, Kurt Peterson, William Redfield, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Let me give you a hand. Oh. Don't you touch that case. What? Huh? I only wanted to help. Put it down. Well, sure. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I see it all now. Kubik arranged for my car to stall out on the turnpike. Then you happen along as if by coincidence and kill me. And take the money. Uh, that's an old trick. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? Oh, yes. It's the last trick you'll ever try. Hey, what are you going to do with that gun? You can't kill me. Oh, but I can. I kill very well. Look, mister. Because I have an instinct. A hunter's instinct. A killer's instinct. I smell, I sense death and murder. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.